This is Edge of the Box, a podcast brought to you by whoscored.com. Hello, welcome back to Edge of the Box, a podcast by whoscored.com in association with Bet Victor. I'm your host, Dan Bardell, joined by Who Scored's very own Martin Lawrence and journalistic genius Jonathan Wilson. Martin, I imagine you're still as high as me about Villa's win at Old Trafford at the weekend. Yeah, I mean, doubly high just based on the fact that Bruno missed that penalty. As high as Bruno's penalty miss, I am. Oh, just nice, because nice. we had that we had that bet in, didn't we? Uh, we'll come on to that later. But yeah, that was lovely to see uh, at the end of the game because I wasn't watching it. Um, lovely to see the little penalty miss icon on whoscored.com. Um, yeah, very enjoyable. Yeah, let's not talk about bets too much because that is something I'm very sensitive about after on this last week. Betting show. <laughs> uh, on this betting show. Let's not, let's not talk about bets <laughs> at all. Jonathan, are you okay? I'm very well, thanks. Yeah. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad. Jonathan's upset me a little bit before we've come on. So we won't <laughs> get into it. We will start with the Premier League team of the month, Martin. I take it you're going to run us through the 11 that who scored have curated. Yeah, I am indeed. Yeah. And it's a pretty strong 11, I must say. Uh, Jonathan will take. Uh, we'll, we'll be the judge of that, Martin. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Jonathan will take issue 100% with the front three or the formation of it, at least. But it's a strong 11 in terms of personnel. So it's Edison in goal. Um, Aaron Wambasaka at right back. I think you saw last night how much Manchester United missed both of their sort of first choice fullbacks. Shaw gets a lot of the credit for the attacking work, but obviously Wambasaka allows them to play that sort of lopsided style, uh, defending on that right side. He's the right back. Thiago Silva at centre back. He's turned 37 last week, but in his three games in September, he made goal saving interventions against Villa and City and scored the opener against Tottenham. He's partnered by Virgil van Dijk, so pretty strong centre-back partnership. And João Cancelo at left-back. Looks like he'll be left-back for for much of this season. And he just impresses me more and more. I see him uh, in the game in PSG in midweek. Some of those through balls, some of those clip balls, his vision's outstanding. Mm. He's been excellent to start the season. Same too for Kovacic, who's the first player of three in midfield. 36% of his goal involvements in the Premier League have come in five starts this season. Uh, he's joined in midfield by Fabinho, got a goal and an assist in, in September, as well as nine interceptions, and Paul Pogba making up a midfield three. And then the front three is Salah, who scored in all of his games in September. That's in all competitions, scored in all five appearances in September. Didn't score enough, uh, though, did you, Salah? Didn't score enough. <laughs> um, Ivan Tony leading the line. Uh, we'll come on to him. I think, I think he's had an outstanding start to his Premier League career. And then Romelu Lukaku completes the front three. <laughs> which is the the point that I, I imagine will, will upset some. But yeah, so it's Edison, wan Thiago Silva, Virgil van Dijk, Joao Cancelo, Mario Kovacic, Fabinho, Paul Pogba, Mohamed Salah, Ivan Tony, and Romelu Lukaku in the Who Scored Team of the Month. It was all going really well. I know, I know. I, so I, left, it to, I left him to the, last as well. And, yeah. Mm. Even if you'd have put him on the right, I think that would have just I know. about... Been I know, but then you got Salah. It's just like you'd have to move know, Salah to the I left. Yeah. Jo- Jonathan, yeah. one of those things. thoughts. I mean, <laughs> it's exactly what you said. I, I would accept Lukaku on the right with with Salah coming inside, but yeah, he just haven't got anybody on the left there. It doesn't make any sense. Disappointed. Okay, but- very, very lopsided. I like the way when you talk about Manchester United's lopsided formation. Surely that's a bad thing to have a, a lopsided formation. Well, I think a lot of managers no, do I don't think so. Certainly with fullbacks, a lot of managers have one push up and one sit back. It's and just not a very complimentary word, lopsided. Uh, it's, no. it's basically exactly what Arsenal did, isn't it, against Tottenham? With Tommy Asu, they signed a, a right back who can play yeah. centre back and it allows them to shift to a three with Tierney pushing on to it. Mm-hmm. Asymmetric maybe is a is Ooh, a, that's a, that's that's a much better word. Yeah, football manager word. That's what I want to hear, Jonathan. I'm back yes. on board. He's railed me back. <laughs> in football manager term that I only know because of football manager. And the, the talking point that we've garnered from from this, Martin, is not that Lukaku playing on the left wing. It is Ivan Tony for England. Now I think Calvert Lewin obviously has been injured. I think Bamford's mm-hmm. a doubt for the squad that gets announced today. That leaves you with Harry Kane. I guess Ollie Watkins and Danny Ings at, at Villa have got an outside chance of, of a call up. But do you, do you think Tony would would get a call up? I think he'd deserve it, whether he gets it or not. Already, uh, I think based on his start to the season, I think what you're looking at as well is he, he's a very comparable player to Dominic Calvert-Lewin in many senses. 
And I think that will be a tussle for a spot personally in the in the England squad. But I think what was maybe overlooked in all these sort of goal scoring exploits last season, obviously record number of goals in the championship last season, got 10 assists as well. His link up play has been outstanding. And Brentford have and they've gone a bit longer into him this season, bypassed the midfield a little bit more. Aerial duels, he's been outstanding. He won nine aerial duels up against Van Dijk and Matip last weekend. And not many strikers will do that. Yeah. And his 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 link up with um uh, and Bermo is very, very good. And he's, he's an intelligent player. We've seen that already this season, even in the games that he didn't score. So Liverpool at the weekend, he was our man of the match in that game against Arsenal. He was very, very good. So, yeah, he's he's, he's been very good. And I just think those injuries, Calvert-Lewin definitely out, Bamford probably out. The one I would say that has a, has a chance and maybe you overlooked and maybe many people will overlook because he's now no longer in the Premier League is Tammy Abraham, who's had a very good start oh, yeah. at Roma. Um, so he he may come back into the reckoning, but I think it is between like you said the the other one is obviously Greenwood, but there's a bit of bit of a debate as to whether Manchester United actually want Mason Greenwood to be called up for England right now. I don't think they they do. Obviously, he was left out last time, so it'll be interesting to see if he's he comes into the reckoning. But yeah, with with Calvert Lewin and Bamford both out, Watkins not scored this season. That 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 will play against him too much. Ings obviously could come back in, but hasn't been in the fold for a while. So I think he's got a shot. I think he'd have to have a shot. He's been very, very good. And he's our he's actually top of our form rankings, Ivan Tony. Uh, and we, this is the first week we can do our form rankings, which is basically using our who scored ratings. It's sort of chronologically ordered. So the most recent game it takes has the most weight over, over that run. So like he's, a power he's, ranking. Like a power ranking, if you want to call it that, Dan. Yeah. 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 Okay, power ranking. All my terms are just getting pass out the window. So yeah, it's, it's Ivan Tony top, Mo Salah second, St. Maximan third, Paul Pogba fourth, Sai Ben Rama fifth, Cancelo sixth, Mane seventh, uh, Saar, Ismail Saar eight, Rafinha nine. Those two come, again, come up against each other this week. We'll come on to that later, but that's a really, really interesting battle. And then Ruben Diaz in 10. So yeah, Ivan Tony certainly showing that he can, that he has what it takes to, to compete at Premier League level already. And I, personally, I think he'd be worth a shot just because of those injuries. Let's stick with the international theme then, but let's look ahead to the weekend's games at the same time. So it's Manchester United v Everton, Jonathan. And it says here, Gray and Townsend impact at Everton. England recalls, question mark. I mean, I think that's probably a little bit too far, but they have got off to a really good start for Everton. Yeah, they have been excellent. And yeah, they, they um, I think there's a lot of disquiet in Everton in the summer uh, about the signings. Um the people thought they hadn't strengthened enough, and they, I think they're a bit underwhelmed by by bringing in two players who I guess people sort of felt they knew and, and, and weren't overly excited by. But both of them have been excellent. I, I, I agree with you. I think they're a long way off an England recall, um, given England's strength in that area. But that that is actually sort of it's more it says more about England's uh, strength and depth and just how many good attacking young players there are now than it says about the two of them. Because if they were playing like this even five years ago. I'm sure both would have been would have been straight in. Yeah, you think of some of the money as well, Jonathan. That Everton have spent on wide players uh, over the years. I think of I think of Walcott. That's the only one I can think of. There was another one. It will be. It will be. Who's yeah. still there? Bernard. Yeah. Mm, yeah. They've spent. They've, you know, bought some big players in, but those two, one and a half million, uh, seven what's million. What's his name? as well. I know that was an injury. Lassie, you see, that was a that was a that was a big big buy. But, you know, one point seven million. I think it is for for the two of them. Really good business. Yeah, really good business, and and you've got to give them credit for that for finding bargains, and, and, and you know I guess it is a lesson that um, just because the players are disappointing at one club doesn't mean that you can't you know, find something still within them. Yeah, and, and Martin sticking with Everton, one of the players who I think goes under the radar a little bit. There was a segment on him on Monday Night Football a few weeks ago, but I think Decore has been one of the standout players of the season so far. I don't know where where he fits in with the who scored rankings, but every time I watch him. Everton and Decore. Decore has been excellent. Yeah, I think he's one of those players when Everton play well, a lot of it is down to him. Um, and obviously Everton have been sort of patchy for a while. But yeah, when he's when he's on it, uh, he's incredibly powerful, isn't he? I think he scored in two of his last three games at Old Trafford. So that's a nice nice little link there, Dan. I'm sure you knew that. Um, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, he is a, he is an impressive player when he's, when he's on it. Um, yeah, just sort of galloping forward, bit of a sort of Yaya Torre style gallop to his to his running forward. Obviously, I wouldn't compare him to him in terms of his ability, but yeah, he's a, he's a very good player. And on, on Gray as well, 
it's, a, it's an interesting one like like you say very very cheap i did think it was it was cheap a lot of people weren't um weren't impressed by the signings so to speak but it was a cheap fee for a player who's who's still he's shown potential throughout his career he's just never really been given a chance he's never averaged more than 60 minutes a game in a season and obviously he'll get that this season he's already only one goal off his best ever season in terms of goals he scored three goals already this season and another nice link to this game, his first ever goal in the Premier League was at Old Trafford and it was an absolute howitzer. You need to go back and watch it if if you can. Hell of a goal. So, yeah, he just he just needs game time. I, I, I agree. They're both both off England recalls. I think it's too late for Townsend anyway. Gray maybe has a shot if he can keep up his keep up his form, but we will see. Yeah, and Jonathan will be pleased to know Damari Gray is doing bits for my fantasy football team <laughs> so far this so far this I season. I imagine Jonathan uses that phrase so. Oh, he well. always is. He's, he's a very famous phrase right? in the Guardian all the time, just talking about <laughs> doing players doing bits in his week in his weekly columns. Um, sticking with you, Martin. Mm-hmm. You know his midfield, obviously McTominay and Fred. Yeah. Now, watching them last week, Manchester United against Villa. I would not have swapped them two for Villa, any of Villa central midfielders that day, or in general, I wouldn't. We've just been yeah. talking about Decore. So Decore mm-hmm. and Alan, I'd probably say I'd rather have them as, as my midfield. It's, quite, it's quite a in. comparable midfield, to be fair, isn't it? You've got the two yeah. two Brazilians who are sort of maybe the more defensive of the two and two sort of powerful, um, tall midfielders. But yeah, yeah. Uh, it was interesting that... Solskjaer is actually right. quite full of I mean, praise. you didn't even let me ask the question, Martin. <laughs> would you swap Alan and Decore for McTominay and Fred? Because I'm, I'm, well, I'm not convinced I would. I'm not convinced I would. Yeah, maybe. It, it, like I said, it's, it's tight, isn't it? But yeah, it was interesting that, that Solskjaer came out. He was quite full of praise of Fred and McTominay after the Villa game. Said they broke the, broke the play up really well. He said ahead of the Villarreal game that they, they are the two that he trusts. They, he likes to play them. They're the two that he trusts in midfield and then didn't play them. <laughs> so that was quite interesting. But obviously we did see in that Villarreal game, where it was essentially a 4-1-4-1. Four, one, four, one. It wasn't wasn't a double pivot with Pogba in, in next to McTominay, I don't think, that they were just completely overrun. And they have been multiple times, especially when Pogba has played deeper in midfield. So, yeah, they've got big, big problems in that area of the pitch. Then I don't think either of them are bad players. They're just not players that you no. would consider to be title-challenging or... or if it weren't for the rest of the squad, then even sort of Champions League challenging, I don't think. Yeah, he just can't get the balance of that team right, can he, Jonathan? He's trying to shoehorn too many players in. They look so unbalanced against Villa. I watched the, the game at Old Trafford and there's just no coherence to, to the system. Players look like they're not sure what they're supposed to be doing. Like They've got like a team of, in, of individuals, but he doesn't seem to be able to make a team out of them. And that's why Villa beat Manchester United, because Villa were a team. Villa knew what they were doing. Yeah, and I think we've seen that all season that United keep getting away with it. So even I know they won four one, but even against Newcastle, Newcastle had chances or, or at least chances to create chances that a more composed team might have taken. So that Villarreal game, you know, they, they end up with the late winner and everybody sort of oh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, another great Champions League night at Old Trafford, and another sort of great injury time winner. Um, although I think they've only actually scored four injury time winners in the Champions League at Old Trafford. Um, and it sort of plays into the narrative of, of, of sort of the yeah Solskjaer rekindling the you know the Fergie magic. The truth is they were rubbish in that game. For an hour they were dreadful. And if Dan Juma had been able to finish half as well as he could dribble, uh, if Dia hadn't had you know taken that chance, what was that, 89th, 90th minute? Um Paco Alcacer had a couple of chances before he scored one. That game could very, very easily have been sort of you know, three nil, four nil after an hour. And and then you're looking at absolute humiliation and Oli probably being sacked. So they, they keep getting away with it. And and for all the reservations uh that people I think quite rightly have about Fred and McDominate together, because it just sort of feels so so uninspiring, feels so flat. And yeah, Fred certainly is somebody who I think has a mistake in him. Uh, they they're much better when the two are there. They win sixty two percent of the games when when the two start, and fifty two percent when they don't. And even the Villa game, uh, it was after McTominay had gone off that the that the, that the winner comes. It's, you know, it's after Cavani's come on and they start to chase the game a bit that they, that, you know, they they they, they crack. So I, I, I sort of feel that United are, are forced to play play the two of them in the absence of any kind of proper structure. And this is where I think you, yeah United have a problem with assessing what's wrong that the tendency is to go well what can ollie do with that midfield 
which is semi-true, but he has been there for six transfer windows. What What is he doing? Is he, is he mm-hmm. saying to people, you know, we need another holding midfielder? But also, you have to you have to create something of what you've got. And, you know, I, I always think back. Well, here, here's, here's, to give me something to stop doing trivia recently, I will introduce yeah, my own trivia. trivia. <laughs> uh, here, so here's my question. Who oh. were the two central midfielders of Manchester United on the day that they beat Arsenal 8-2? Uh-huh. I'd imagine one of them would be Fletcher. Maybe. No. Anderson. Anderson, very good. Oh, nice. Tom Cleverley. Tom Cleverley. Tom Cleverley. I wouldn't have got that. Anderson, to be the, honest. And that's, that's a central midfield that, that somehow rips apart. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and Arsenal, who were um, having some issues, but still one of the biggest teams in the league. So you, you, you can do it with, with lesser players if the structure's right. But Solskjaer's not quite good enough to... Yeah, he's not he's not a terrible manager, but he's not in that very top bracket. And and so the you know the failures on both sides that okay, his squad's a bit unbalanced, he could do with an extra high class midfielder. But equally a, a better manager would probably do more with what's there. Excellent trivia, Jonathan. Let's get the trivia back in the podcast, Martin. It's a right, big, okay. big miss. All big, right. big miss. We've got some rankings, haven't we, Martin? Have we got some rankings of central midfield partnerships? Well, we do, yeah. Well I looked into it based on our who scored ratings since the start of last season. And uh, it's based on the sort of two most used central midfielders of each team. So that I know I knew I'd have get, got in trouble if I'd have included the likes of De Bruyne and Mason Mount in that and all that sort of thing. So it is sort of central midfielders, um, the two most used. And, and the Manchester United midfield two of Fred and McTominay ranks eighth, uh, eighth in our ratings, which I think sounds about right personally. Mm, yeah. uh, so they they are behind uh, Man City, Chelsea, Liverpool. Uh, Brighton, Southampton, and Leicester and West Ham. So is that eighth or ninth? But yeah, so uh, actually, it's uh, the the top three is actually Man City, West Ham, and Leicester in our in our ratings. But yeah, uh, yeah, eighth. So they are actually ahead for what it's worth. They're ahead of Ducore and Allen, who are eleventh, based on what you asked earlier. So. But there's not a lot in it. Current form, though, I think I'd rather have to call. Yeah, it well, well, when are, that's from the beginning of last season, is Start it? Start of yeah. last season, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I think Everton have just fundamentally changed how they play since Benitez came in. So, yeah, it's about it's about mid yeah. the midfield too is about giving the rest of the team a platform. So if I'd have had to have guessed, I would have actually said West Ham might have been top of that with Rice and Suchet because I think they yeah, give second. a good protection of the defence, which I think McTominay and Fred and Fred do. But they also offer something going forward. I think it's well, when, that side. Well, of you can say that of Leicester as well. Who's Leicester? Exactly. Indeed, and Tielemans. Yeah, and, 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 yeah, and, and, and those that's a nice midfield. It's interesting that those two they've both been linked to Manu have been linked to Rice and Tielemans, haven't they? So. Yeah, That'd be a nice midfield. Those would be that would be a nice midfield. But yeah, yeah, you can see why they're linked to those two based on those those ratings. Yeah, and we've got a tip as well, haven't we, Martin? We do indeed. Um, it's just it revolves around Bruno Fernandez, who will be looking to obviously bounce back after his penalty miss. Uh, he scored four goals in four games against Everton, and over those games, he's had a miserly twenty shots <laughs> in four games, uh, four in each, at, at least four in each. So we've gone for Fernandez to score and have four or more shots. Uh, Bet Victor have boosted that to five to two. But another not, another interesting point ahead of this game, and I think, like Jonathan said, it would have been would have been interesting to see the reaction for Solskjaer had they not won, or indeed had they lost. I think there's a split in the United fans where the sort of match going fans are pro Solskjaer and hmm. the sort of events of last night only strengthen that, that sort of last minute goal. It feels special. Um, but there's sort of the rest of the fan base that don't go to the games are very, very much against it, that seem to be against him. So sort of Twitter, the social fans, if you if you know, know yeah. what I mean. So there's, there's an obvious divide in Man United fans uh, and their win rate at home in the Premier League under Solskjaer is only 50 percent now. Uh, and that's the exact same as Everton, for what it's worth. It's less than Leicester, less than Tottenham, Chelsea, City, Liverpool. So uh, to have a win rate of only 50% as Man United manager at Old Trafford, uh, not great. So he's he's clinging on. Um, but I think that the fact that he still has goodwill amongst the fans in the stadium and, and the players, it seems at least, will, mm. will keep him in the job for now. Yeah, I've talked to kind of quite a few Manchester United fans, and and, and you know who are match going fans who are pro Solskjaer, and their argument is always, "Oh, you you can't understand what he means to yeah. us." Well, all right, it's slightly patronising to fans of other clubs <laughs> because other clubs have also had <laughs> players they've liked. But putting that aside, if you gave uh, one of these match going Manchester United fans 
you can say to them, right, in the next three years, you can win three Premier Leagues and the Champions League, but you have to sack Sotia tomorrow and appoint Antonio Conte, for instance. Or you can win one Premier League and no Champions League under Sotia, which would you rather do? Uh, if their answer is they prefer the latter, well, fine, at least an in con- internal consistency there. But if it's the former, what are they, what are they clinging on to? Yeah, mm. I think there's comparisons there with Chelsea, isn't there? With Lampard, a lot. Of, when no, Lampard, no, come on, Sarsi has a better manager than Lampard. No, I know, but when Lampard was sacked, there was let's not be silly. I, I have Chelsea <laughs> fan friends who were still like, I would have given him longer uh, when Tuchel came in, uh, and Tuchel's come in, and he can he can coach and look at look at them now. So yeah, yeah. Let's do our score predictions. I think we spent a little bit too long on Manchester United <laughs> against Everton. Jonathan, what's yours? One one. One one. Not nice, Martin. I need to find it. Sorry. Oh, come on. So I'll do mine then. I've gone 2 1 Manchester United, but I've actually got a feeling that Everton will pull off a shock. I mean, uh, yeah, I might have been more confident for Everton had Richarlison and Calvert Lewin not been out. And, and Pickford's out as well, I think, which. I again, doubt, yeah. Is. Yeah. Yeah, we've, got, uh, we've gone 2 1 as well. To Manchester. One to Manchester United. Yeah. Excellent. So, my, my prediction was a bit more of a safety tip, like yeah. to, to be honest, because thinking everyone else would have them to win. So, yeah. <laughs> right, let's move on then to the to, to the just a minute section. And we've got the, let's do this, get the recap done, Martin. Let's get it out of the way. <laughs> the recap that, what, last week's predictions? Ah, oh, poor again, wasn't not it? Not good <laughs> at all again. Yeah, not good at all. So, Jonathan stretched his lead. So, good for Jonathan. Good for jo- even though got away um, with it to be honest. Yeah, um, yeah. Got that last minute equaliser for Brighton. Yeah, a lot couple of, of correct results. I had Palace to win. I was the only one that had Palace to bloody win yeah. as well, and they conceded the ninety fifth minute. Yeah. So yeah, Jonathan had two correct results and one correct score. So seven points took him up to fifty. Who scored one correct score, three correct results, so six points to forty six. And Dan, one correct score, Wolves one nil at Southampton, and one only one correct result, so four points. 45. Jeez. So you, Dan now t- slides to the bottom. All chain. Look, this is a crazy season. God. Absolutely crazy season in the edge of great the shot, panel prediction. Great shout on Wolves to win 1 0. No one else went for that, did they? Fantastic yeah, shout. Yeah, we'll shout it it no forgives the eight incorrect scores. Yeah, I was going to say, it's no, it's, no good, it's no good getting Wolves away at Southampton right when you get absolutely everything else wrong. That's terrible. Let's start with Wolves then in the just a minute section. It's Wolves against Newcastle for you, Jonathan. I think there's a general sense that Wolves have been playing a bit better than the results have suggested. Um, but it's pretty hard to, to pick any patterns in, in, in their form. The one thing you can say is that in all six league games they've played so far this season, one team has failed to score. So if Wolves score, they win. If they don't score, they lose. It's as simple as that. Um, Newcastle have not kept a clean sheet this season, which sounds like bad news uh, for them based on that previous statistic. Uh, last season, both these games finished 1-1. Uh, very late Murphy goal at Molyneux to, to salvage a point for Newcastle. Um, and Newcastle, you know, going forwards, really struggling with no uh, no Callum Wilson. Uh, LaSalle also missing at the back. Shelby's missing from midfield. They've got the usual problems with goalkeepers. So given their inability to keep a clean sheet and given that previous start about Wolves, I fancy a Wolves win here, probably low scoring. So I'm saying 1-0 to Wolves. After everything you've just said there, I'm really pleased that I've predicted Wolves to win 2-0. So at least that prediction makes sense from what, what you've said. Martin, who scored? Yeah, 1-0 to Wolves as well. Oh, God, they're going to win 1-0, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> not, not great. Your game's Burnley against Norwich, Martin. Uh, two bottom clubs go head-to-head this weekend, and it's safe to say defeat for either side would spell trouble. Burnley's long wait for a home win in the Premier League now spans 13 matches, and failure to beat the only team below them in the table would have fans wondering if they'll ever see a Turf Moor win again. They've won six league matches in a row at home to Norwich, though, scoring at least two goals in each. Defeat at Everton last weekend means Norwich have now lost 16 consecutive Premier League matches. They've failed to score in their travels this season and have now scored just one goal in their last 10 away games in the top flight. Emi Buendia was the scorer of that goal in a 2-1 defeat at Watford and his departure has seen the supply line to Timo Pukki all but dry up. Todd Cantwell's potential return can't come soon enough. He could be back. A defeat here would surely leave even the most optimistic of Norwich fans preparing for another season in the Championship before we even reach October. Burnley's tally of two points is actually one better than they had after six games last season. They had to wait until game week eight to get a win last year, but should go one better this time around. So we're going 2-0 Burnley. I've gone wild. Burnley 3-0. I saw this. 
absolutely wild prediction game of the weekend <laughs> yeah well, you mark, mark my words mark my words mine that, that's coming Jonathan with you chose uh, 3-1 to Burnley 3-1 to Burnley so that's not, there's only one, one goal oh, difference off. there it's, yeah, you're the one that's wrong on this occasion Martin. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. Uh, what I will say to you Martin is I mean, I've not had a great start to this podcast with Jonathan I sent yeah. my predictions and my tip over very very promptly when you yeah, said very it good. I don't know not even an acknowledgement I Sorry, a, yeah. Not well, even a, uh, there's you. another story around that. Jonathan sent Jonathan the predictions he sent were for game week ten. <laughs> he oh, sent, sent, sent predictions for games three, <laughs> four weeks in the future. Just hit the, <laughs> hit the wrong button on the algorithm. It's uh, easily done. So you, uh, are you going to stick to those predictions? Uh, you, surely you don't. In four weeks, so you don't want to change them. Now you know you've already done them. Well, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see what happens. That's interesting. Interesting tactic that is going going four weeks ahead. Really, really. Just trying to get in his head. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to when you're top of the day, Jonathan. You're already there, rent free. Chelsea against Southampton for you. Having started the season incredibly impressively and looking like they were able to pretty much control any game, uh, which allied to, to the arrival of Lukaku made them, yeah, look look arguably title favourites uh, overseas. Uh, they've had a bit of a wobble. Uh, weren't particularly impressive in either game against Villa, either in the league or the League Cup. Although they did end up you know, winning both of them. Uh, first half against Tottenham, they were poor. They weren't very good against Zenit in the um, Champions League. And then they've, you know, they've lost the last two games against City and Juve 1-0. And against City particularly, they, they just looked unable to get through the press. Now, the difference in those last two games is the absence of Mason Mount. He's still a doubt. And I think he's a huge, huge miss for them, uh, given his tactical intelligence, given the way he links the, the midfield and forward lines. Uh, James and Kante also out. And both of them, I think, are, are big losses uh, James, because of what he, he his, his absence means, they, they miss on the right hand side. So that can't score goals. They've only conceded one in the last three, though. But I, I still think Chelsea will have too much. And I'm saying two nil Chelsea. Yeah, I've gone for three nil to Chelsea. Who scored? Two nil to Chelsea. <laughs> Ominous that again. Right, Leeds against Watford for you, Martin. Yeah, another of five teams without a victory after six matches. Many Leeds fans will see this as a must-win game heading into the international break. That said, they've lost each of their last four meetings with Watford, but a huge amount of change of both clubs in the five years that since their last clash. It doesn't seem possible that their far- last meeting was five years ago. Uh, not least the, the departure of Troy Deeney from the Hornets. He scored in each of the last four league meetings between the two, but that's irrelevant now. Rafinha should be fit, having been withdrawn as a precaution against West Ham in a change that perhaps swung that game in the Hammers' favour. The Brazilian was ultimately a replacement for one Ishmael Assar at Ren, and the prospect of the two wingers on either flank means this should be a really entertaining game, both featuring our top 10 former rankings in the Premier League, so it could be a long afternoon for new new left-backs Danny Rose and Junior Firpo. The former has been booked three times in four games for Watford, so it looks a good bet for a card this weekend. Leeds remain without the likes of Lorente, Cott, Ailing at the back and Bamford up front, while Watford are only really sweating on the fitness of keeper Daniel Backman. That may level the playing field somewhat in a game that would usually see the hosts as firm favourites, so we're going 1-1. One, one. I've gone 3-1 to Leeds. Leeds to get off the mark for the season with a victory. Uh, Jonathan? I've split the difference and gone 2-1 to Leeds. 2-1 to Leeds. Interesting. Uh, right, it's the Ben White, Danny Welbeck derby <laughs> for you, Jonathan. Brighton against Arsenal. I think I mean, Arsenal fans seem absolutely delighted with how things are going after one good win, uh, which maybe is premature, and this is a big test of that. But, you know, they, they did have players missing those first three games of the season, which were tough fixtures that they lost. They've won the last three, so things are clearly improving. Uh, Granit Xhaka uh, has a knee problem, and he, he was very, very good against Tottenham. Um, but this is this is a much tougher test, I think, than Tottenham. Brighton this season won four out of six. They weren't great against Palace, got away with it with that last-minute equaliser, but that was with was without Basuma. Now he may be back, and I think if he does come back in, this this you know this is a you know a proper challenge. Uh, Brighton last season uh, they accumulated twenty point four one points under their expected points which is why I thought it would be better this season but this season they're 5.6 points ahead so will there be a regression I'm not sure and so I'm saying 1-1 I have gone for 1-1 as well I think I might even be the first time I predicted Arsenal to pick up a point well, it's Brighton isn't it this was a real battle for yeah. the two teams that you just yeah two of them together to yeah yeah, yeah uh, we've, actually, we've gone with Arsenal 2-1 a real mix of predictions there right let's do Palace against Leicester Martin 
Games between Palace and Leicester are rarely dull and rarely predictable as well, particularly at Selhurst Park, where each team has two wins in the last six meetings. Patrick Vieira's side suffered late heartache against rivals Brighton last time out, with newly appointed penalty taker Will Zaha scoring from the spot. He scored in both matches between these sides last season, facing his two favourite sides in succession with an impressive seven goals in total against the Foxes. Neither side head into this game with any fresh injury concerns, though that is ahead of Leicester making the round trip to Legia Warsaw. Uh, Vardy was rested for the opening European game against Napoli and maybe once more having scored a brace against Burnley after netting at the wrong end initially. He scored three in his last three starts against Palace too, so a Zaha Vardy anytime scorer a double might be of interest. Brendan Rodgers' side look a little more like themselves from an attacking standpoint last time out. Over a third of their total shots this season came against Burnley. Meanwhile, despite a clear development in their build-up play, Palace now have had the fewest shots on target in the league. They're unbeaten at home this season so far, though, and we think it will stay that way against Leicester, struggling uh, to juggle European commitments. So we've gone one all, uh, Palace Leicester. Mm, I've gone two one to Leicester, but I'm not convinced by that at all. Jonathan, two one to Palace. There we go. That's what we yeah. like. Let's finish then, Jonathan, with West Ham against Brentford, London Derby. Well, Brentford have actually been, given their reputation, have been relatively restrained this season. You know, they they have this reputation for for quite wild, direct uh, football that flows from end to end. And un- until Saturday, they hadn't really shown that. But we you know we, we saw that against Liverpool. We saw how thrilling and how effective it can be. Um, but actually, away from home, they've been able to control games a lot more than that. Uh, they've only let in one goal away from home so far this season. Obviously, a trip to West Ham these days is 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 very is very testing, and it'll be even even harder if Pinnock is out with hip injury, as as seems likely. Uh, West Ham have a doubt over Kufal, which which is a problem for them, uh, given what he offers uh, going forward from right back. But I think they are genuinely good now. I think not just the team, but the squad. Uh, one three only lost one out of six games a season. That one they missed a penalty uh, against Manchester United in, the, in in injury time to to salvage a point. Uh, seven goals in three home games. I think they'll probably just have enough for Brentford here. So I'm saying 2-1 to West Ham. I've gone West Ham 1, Brentford 1. I don't think I've predicted Brentford to, to lose yet. They're like the opposite of my Brighton and Arsenal <laughs> predictions. Martin, who scored? We've well, gone 3-2 West Ham. Should be a cracker. Oh, we're going that's, a wild, that's wild. Antonio <laughs> against Tony as well. That's a nice little yeah. battle. The, yeah. Antonio's top of our ratings in general. And Tony, top of our form ranking. So... They'll both be terrible yeah. now, but there we go. You'll, you'll never win anything predicting three toes, Martin. Absolutely <laughs> not. You'll never Come on, win Bernie. anything. <laughs> right, let's do it then. The real low point of the podcast this one. We've got a treble <laughs> this week but for the 3 p.m. game Saturday, but we've got to go back and recap over last week. And I've cost us again, although I think there can be an element of forgiveness this time round. I was very unfortunate. You were unfortunate. No, we'll just go back through it. We'll go back through the winners, and this is getting this is getting common now. Jonathan and and who scored both winning? Um, who scored? Well, predicted didn't, a didn't, win, didn't win anything. No, that's true. No, no good, no good <laughs> true. Have you, have you thought true. I changed this section to a double? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on that topic, actually, uh, we've only, we've never had more than one incorrect sort of leg of a treble so far. It's pretty impressive, to be fair. It's usually me. Yeah, it is usually you, despite me being the bet ruiner. Um, you were the first one to get one wrong. That's a, you you yeah, set the bad ruin in motion. The, the only one I've got wrong, and this is relevant to, to, to the tip this week, is I predicted Arsenal to, to score two, I think, against Norwich, or to win by more than one against Norwich. Mm-hmm. And they hit the woodwork yeah. twice in winning 1-0. That's the only thing that's cost me a, a, a full house this season. Yeah, well, we're, 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 I'm the bet ruiner, and we, who scored the exact same? Four out of five for who scored as well. Dan now on two out of five. So, Not is this three. Like, no, two out of five. So, I thought I got two wrong. Mm, bet dear. ruiner. Are you, going ruiner. To, are you going to apologise to Martin? <laughs> Oh yeah, you know what? You've come in with the office reference, and I've forgotten the return. That's a, yes. that, is, that is that is that is upsetting. That is really that is really really upsetting. What was the what was the response? I already have, in a way. That's it. Oh no! Oh, real. I really not enjoying this. This week, I've interfered, and we've got a goal scorer treble, and it is based on your your very prompt tip. So you can go with yours first, Dan, if you want. I've gone for Jimenez to score for Wolves against Newcastle. I feel like he's a bit of a streaky player. Once he gets one, you go on a run of scoring goals. And Newcastle are pap, so you know, they haven't kept a clean sheet. They haven't kept a clean sheet this season, as we know from the. From I looked the up a section. stat. Looked up a stat for you, Dan. And his last home goal 
was against Newcastle. So there you go. Before his injury, oh, his last uh, game. That was a, that was another consideration of mine. <laughs> uh, I uh, who scored have gone for Chris Wood to score any time uh, against Norwich. He scored five goals in four starts against Norwich. So yeah, Chris Wood and Raúl Jiménez. And then I forced one on Jonathan. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I'm not taking responsibility for this. <laughs> no, My I'm tip, just to, be, just to be clear, was Chelsea to win to nil. But apparently, despite the habitually being right, that's not good enough. <laughs> and so we're going for uh, some bloke called Lukaku or something to score, whoever he is. Nice. Seven, like seven in seven. Seven in seven against uh, Southampton in his last seven. Four in five against the world. That's true, yeah. Well, we just thought like we had two goal scorers and then a, a win to nil. It's just a bit random. Not not that all of our tips haven't been utterly random, but there we go. Why the odds? Uh, the odds on that boosted. So Bet Victor War already the sort of industry leading price on that. Uh, so, but they've pushed it a little further. So it's eight to one on those three to score any time in their game. So all at home, all the favourites to score in those games. So Jimenez, Wood, and Lukaku to score any time, eight to one. If Betfix had anything about them, they'd have made that nine to one, and we'd have called it the number nines treble because they're all all wear nine. Come on, Betvictor, put that up to put up that up to nine to one. That'll, that'll garner some interest, in my opinion. I, I, I like that. That's a good one. I'll be I'll be getting on that. I think I think that's got. A you love chance. a goal scorer tip, though, don't you? And Jonathan well, loves a win to nil. Jo- Jonathan win to win to nil. Wilson, it's proper football winning to nil. <laughs> yeah, let's move on then. I tell you what, I do love. Aston Villa Football Club away at Adam Hotspur on Sunday at, at, at 2 pm. Excellent win last week away at Manchester United and Martin. I fancy Villa again. Do you? Yeah, well, yeah. it's, it's kind of hard not to, I guess, just based on, on how Tottenham are playing at the moment, as much as how Villa are playing, and Villa are playing well. Uh, but yeah, obviously, Tottenham were a mess, particularly in the first half against Arsenal. Obviously, there were a lot of those bizarre tactics I've ever seen. Yeah, the images going around of Tottenham basically playing a circle formation with nothing in the middle. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see what what Nuno does in re- in reaction to that. So, like, obviously, he hasn't played his ha- hasn't switched to a back three yet. He did I think he did in the first game in their Conference League, but that was with a team of kids really. So it'll be interesting to see if he does go back to that. I know he said at the start of the season. I know. Um, from a source, in fact, that he said that he was going to play Ooh. a back four to Matt Doherty, who was then obviously put out because he can't play a, mat, a back four. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see if they go to a back three. Tottenham, certainly under Mourinho, were not good in a back three. So that might might be in his sort of thinking. They played 10 games in a back three in the league under Mourinho and won two of them, uh, four draws, four defeats. So yeah, I guess that'll be, that'll be interesting. I do think it's a, a system that can suit them. It would suit some uh, of their new signings. Uh, Romero at the back played in a back three at At- Atalanta. Emerson has played wing back. Uh, Reggion has played wing back. So I think, I think it's a system that can work. So yeah, interesting. I think they absolutely should be playing throughout the back. I I cannot believe that that they're not, especially as that's a a formation that's been good for Nuno in the past. I mean, I think the problem is, I agree with you in terms of the defence. They've certainly got the players to do it defensively. Yeah. I think Sanchez arguably is better in a three, uh, the, you know, he, if he plays on the right of the three, he can sort of step up a bit more. Uh, I think Tanganga could play on that right of the three if they needed him to. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the problems in midfield, they're just a little bit short of, yeah. of, of, of real high class in the middle of midfield. So I can see why you'd want three players in there rather than two. So you'd be playing Heiberg plus Ali or Winks or Ndombele. Skip, skip, yeah. Skip, yeah. It would have to be Winks or Skip, really, wouldn't it, in that system, you'd have thought. Mm. Well, but Ali, Ali could do it if he could go back to being the player he was when he first came through. Yeah, just lost like, it completely. Yeah, you, honestly, I didn't, you didn't even know he was playing on on Sunday mm. against Arsenal. It's invisible. I think he was format. best when he was playing. Sort of, it was him and Eriksson behind Kane in that sort of two-one. Uh, and if he's too deep, but like he's, he can defend and he's got a good work rate. But I think the thing with Ali and the thing that was obviously picked up a lot at the start of his career was that sort of tenacity in him and that that at times that he went over the edge. I was thinking, I can't remember the last time Deli Ali was even involved in a sort of controversial incident or anything like that. And there was a lot of talk of like, do they need to sort of coach that out of him, that bite, that aggression, or is that important? And it seems to me like that's very, very important. And I just... He, he was a really sort of feisty player and I just don't see that in Deli Alley anymore. No, completely lost his way. It was a shame because he was a real fun player to watch as well, but he's mm. just completely gone from his game. Now, excellent line of question here. I love this question. It didn't come from me before I get, I get the blame, Jonathan. 
Have Villa now got a stronger squad than Spurs? Oh, uh, <laughs> certainly comparable. Yeah. Mm. Um, and actually, I think there's um, the, the, you know, the obvious point in comparison is what do you do when you have one obvious star who is keen to leave? Uh, and I sort of feel that Spurs' has absolute unwillingness to listen to, to reasonable offers for Kane uh, is actually indicative of their insecurity that what makes them a big club is having Kane. And you, you, it's similar to what happened with Arsenal, that they end up offering contracts with far too long to Ozil and Aubameyang just because they felt, well, if we lose them, we're somehow not a big club anymore. Whereas actually, if you're a forward-thinking, confident club, you don't really worry about status. You just sort of think, you know what, 100 million quid, we can get in three players, four players for 25, 30 million, and that will make us stronger. We're not reliant on this one, one figure. And I think, I mean, it's very early days, but it, it appears that Villa have done that exceptionally well, that bringing in Ings and Buendia and um, Bailey, they, they, they just look a, a, a better, more balanced squad now than they were. And OK, maybe they haven't got a player of the absolute outstanding quality of Grealish, but they look a more sustainable Premier League force now, to me, than they did at this time last year. I mean, Buendia and Bailey have, have barely played, Martin, but I think that's the, the biggest thing now, is that last season you'd watch Villa... And it would be just give give the ball to Grealish and see what yeah. he can do. But they look a lot more rounded now that they are more of a team. That was why they won at Old Trafford last week. I'm trying mm. I'm having to try really hard not to say we. This is why Villa won at, won at Old Trafford last week because they were that team. They were that cohesive unit. The mid the midfield three: Louise, Ramsey, and McGinn. Absolutely excellent. Certainly, neutral fans would have looked at that as maybe a weakness. Um, yeah. I think Jacob Jacob Ramsey's. Uh, been a revelation this season. I think he'll be a really important player. Obviously, a lot of the talk in the transfer window around Villa was not signing a midfielder. Yeah, it's worked okay so far. But yeah, they signed a lot of attackers, and it was difficult to see where they all fit in. But they haven't all been fit already, and they've needed they've needed they've needed all those options because the only one that's been fit has been El Ghazi, and he's he's probably the fourth choice of the, of the wide options. Watkins has been out. Traore has been out. Buendia missed out because of the international. Bailey's been out constantly. So. Yeah, this, so to get the results that they have, and they've toyed with formations, they've brought in different defenders, so they've, they they look strong. And they've got goals from across the pitch now, which is important when you do lose a key player like Grealish. They've had seven different goal scorers in the Premier League already. Only City and Chelsea have had more. And by comparison, Tottenham have only had two. Uh, Kane, obviously not one of those. Deli Ali is, and that was a penalty. So the only other one is, is Son. Uh, so yeah, in terms of goals across the pitch, certainly Villa look... Certainly, Villa looks stronger, and they haven't even had Watkins score yet either. So no. seven different goal scorers already. So yeah, they do look do look good in terms of squad depth, and and that's what Villa have lacked for for some time. Yeah, I think Villa have used twenty two players now this season, which is yeah. a staggering amount for for, for mm. this early door. Still in September at the, at the moment, Jonathan. How do you see this game going? One one, one one for you, Martin. So on twenty two players, uh, yeah. you must know this stat. How does that compare to the number of players Villa used in winning the title? In eighty to eighty one, oh, was it God. was it fourteen? Oh, very good. Well done, well done, Dan. Yeah, oh, there very we go. Well, loving, the trivia, s- <laughs> loving the trivia, Jonathan. <laughs> Especially we when just it's pass it over to Jonathan now. Yeah, yeah. 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 Jonathan to insert his trivia in <laughs> every week. We don't. I don't like to talk about eighty one, eighty two as a Villa fan. Though we, we, we don't like talking about it too much. <laughs> no, at all. Martin, what's your what's your uh, prediction? Yeah, we we I should say we who scored have gone two one. It wasn't just me. It wasn't just me. Two one to Villa. The score team were in agreement. Two one to Aston Villa, and one of them's yeah, a Tottenham got, fan as well. So, I've gone for that as well. Two one for Villa. The same as at the end of last season when Villa travelled to Spurs. Liverpool versus Manchester City to come. The big big game on Sunday. But before us three get into it, let's talk to Sam Boswell from Bet Victor. Sam, welcome. Let's get straight into it. The big one this weekend at Anfield. Liverpool against Manchester City. Manchester City fresh from a great victory in the league, although they did stumble in the Champions League in midweek. And Liverpool the opposite way around. A bit of a stumble against Brentford in the league, but then a good win in midweek in the Champions League. How do Bet Victor see this going? Yeah, should be a cracker, shouldn't it, Dan? I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, we've got 9-5 to five Liverpool home side to get the win. 12 to 5 the draw, which has been popular. 11 to 8 City away from home to gain three vital points in their title charge. When you look at these kind of games on paper, you do expect them to be 
the kind of thing that's going to play a huge part in deciding who becomes champion. Uh, punters love to get involved. Mo Salah did us a huge favour because you lads were on to absolutely clean up last week with a 50-1 uh, to 1 treble. Just needed him to get that goal, second goal, I should say. Uh, he's been of interest already in the goal scorer markets, partly because I think people expect him to start. He's 4-1 to one shot the first goal scorer with ourselves. Like to Diego Jota next in at 5-1. to one. Sterling 6-1 to one to haunt his former team. Although, from memory, I don't think he's got the best record when he starts against them. Uh, no. City players, not as popular in those kind of markets, but I think that's in part down to the classic issue of Pep Roulette, which, let's be honest, is a little bit frustrating for fantasy football players. And if you're trying to have a bet, you've got to wait for that all-important team news. It'd be fascinating to see what he does. I think we're in for a really interesting game. Uh, what do you reckon, Dan? Going to be a close one? I've got a feeling for Firmino. You didn't pick pick up on Firmino there. What, what are his odds looking like? Because I, I think he, he did well in midweek in the Champions League. I actually think he, he might start. I feel like this is his kind of game against City. I, I mean, I won't give it away too much because we've got to come on to it in the show. But I fancy Liverpool to do the job and get the job done against City at home at Anfield with the fans there, to be honest. That's very interesting. 15 to 2 first goal scorer, Firmino, which is probably a, a shade too big if he starts. I'd say I appreciate he's not necessarily the consistent goal scorer that people think he should be, but he does a hell of a lot of work for that side and he can turn a good performance in when he wants to we've got a few boosts i must mention if you think the opposite of dan and you think city are going to get the job done half time full time we've boosted that to 16 to 5 uh jotter any times been boosted actually as well that's now 21 to 10 uh, the bet builders are on site as well loads for you to get stuck into their various markets everyone can enjoy the classic both teams to score and win markets are up as well 16 to 5 for city i, I i'm not so sure on goals on this one i must say and a couple of markets attracted me. I, I, I quite like the unders. Uh, I think under 2.5 at 23 to 20 might be where my pin would land on this game. But it's going to be an absolute cracker. Got great football all weekend. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what you guys think is going to happen in this hopefully top of the table clash hopefully fingers crossed for some great football this weekend thanks ever so much for joining us sam it is always appreciated yeah no problem at all dan all i just want to add is uh, encourage everyone to gamble responsibly good weekend of football before the international break fingers crossed we see a few goals liverpool against manchester city then 4 30 on sunday martin we're gonna go straight in there with the combined 11 that's what we're gonna do oh, wait, wow okay. yeah well, gonna, right in there yeah gonna prep me for that no Jeez, come on uh, i need it up in front of me so allison is in goal obviously that's the debate isn't it with brazil as well allison versus edison he he gets a nod and this is based on ratings this season alone we're, we're moving into this season now uh there's been six games so we're going to move into this season um allison in goal it's Trent at right back who's had a, an excellent start. So too as Carl Walker, should say. But yeah, Trent just for his sort of attacking output has been brilliant this season. He's injured, isn't he, Trent now? He's a doubt. Yeah, he's a yeah. doubt. But um, not confirmed out yet, I don't think. But okay. Klopp said he's most likely to be out. Um, the centre-back pairing is gladly what you'd expect. It's Van Dijk and Ruben Diaz at centre-back. And Joao Cancelo ahead of Robertson at left-back. Robertson's been injured this season and... Simikas has actually done really well, but Cancelo left back, and I'd agree with that. Uh, the two in midfield is Rodri and Gundogan, uh, which is uh, debatable, I guess. So Fabinho's had a very good season as well, so that, that's a tight call with Rodri in particular, I'd say. The three behind Jesus is the striker. I'll just ruin that, but the, uh, Jesus is the striker based on this season. And then Salah on the right, Grealish behind Jesus and Mane on the left, uh, based on this season's ratings. So... I'll go for it quickly. Allison in goal, Trent right back, Van Dyke and Diaz centre back, Cancelo left back, Gundogan and Rodri in midfield, Salah, Grealish, Mane in support of Jesus. I'll take, I'll take umbrage with a couple of things there, but I'll move I'm over sure to you Jonathan do. and see what he thinks. I'm just baffled that we're picking a formation and neither side play when they both play the same one. formation. Mm. I would I would also say Grealish has played every game on the left and we're playing him as a number 10. He's played, he's just played every game on the right and he's playing up front. Hasn't played every game on the right. Played against Chelsea up front. And Grealish, mm. played, more the first, on the right there. Grealish played the first game in the middle as well. So they've, they've played in their positions. That's fine. Mm, okay. But yeah, Jonathan, as Jonathan says, neither team really plays that formation. It's fair. It's just based it's on good. ratings. Just based some on good players. Some good players in there. Also yeah, a few players. Win some games. Yeah. Yeah, a few players whose bodies are made out of biscuits there as well because there's a couple of players <laughs> who are injured at the moment making, making that team. Let's talk about the game in general then. And let's start with, with Jack Grealish, Jonathan. Are we surprised at how quickly he's emerged as the, the first name in, in the City attack? I mean, he had a difficult night up against Hakimi on, on, on Tuesday. I thought I thought I actually thought Grealish played well. 
but Hakimi really did give him a tough time. I, I'm slightly baffled by by a lot of things uh, to do with City and to do with Grealish. Um, so City, in five games away from the Etihad this season, if you include the Community Shield, they've only scored two goals, and that's obviously a problem. And uh, Grealish has has played some part in all of those games. Uh, Lovie only came for bench in the Community Shield. I, I think an instinct would be that he slows them down a bit. Certainly, having been at the Tottenham game, I, I felt he was he was running down cul-de-sacs a bit. I think, and you'd expect this. He's still learning how to play the City way. I think he he sort of started to play a lot of slightly pointless tappy passes inside, where whereas so it may be more more risky options on. Uh, as though sort of his confidence isn't quite there. But then if you look at his stats against Chelsea, he's actually really, really good. He played um, really well against Chelsea. His, I think he he had double the number of pre- pressures as any other City forward in that game. And I think he made double the number, created double the number of, of shooting opportunities of, of any other City player. So I don't think it's necessarily he's playing badly. It's just a sort of, I'm not sure he's quite yet in the system. But you'd expect that. I mean, it took Mahrez pretty much a year to to, to adapt to that. Um, and, and I guess the fact he is he is being picked pretty much every game is indicative of, of Guardiola's desire to, to get him used to that system. Um, there's also clearly an issue with Sterling. And we you know, I know we've talked about this a lot, but he, Sterling basically hasn't played well for City since sort of February, March time. There's that very odd comment he made at the Euros about why he wasn't scoring for City but hinted that there was something going on that we didn't know about, but we still don't know what that is. Um, and I think that was really one of their problems on on Tuesday was that they, they just, although they did win the game, I think 1.9 to 0.8 on the XG, uh, they never really looked like, after, after the Bernardo miss, um, they never really, you never really had a sense they were about to score. Um, so brilliant as they were against Chelsea last week, I, I I'm slightly unsure about him away from home. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm unsure. I don't know. Hmm. It felt a bit like watching Villa last season. You know, they were behind. And it did seem like, I know Hakimi shackled him. But I think he shackled him because all Man City were doing was giving Graylish the ball. Get the yeah. ball out while I give it to Graylish, say what I can do. It was very similar to watching Villa last season. Yeah, I'd say almost like a lot of the talk was if Graylish is going to work at Man City, he needs to adapt. And it's almost been more the other way around so far and not not necessarily to great success it's almost been sort of man city ad- adapting to jack grealish rather than the other way around and i agree with jonathan i think we've just seen a slightly inhibited version of of full full scale jack grealish uh not quite been at his best but he has he's still looked bright for them and like i say he's played the most minutes he's played uh only one fewer minute than sterling and phil foden combined and those are the two that he's sort of fighting for for england i know foden was out for the first three games of the season, I think, but still played a lot of football. And that's, that has surprised me a bit. I did think he'd be an important player and a lot of sort of, I guess, disgruntled Villa fans as much as anything were saying he's going to warm the bench or whatever. Definitely didn't think that would be the case. Never. But yeah, it, it, to, to start every game in the Champions League and the league uh, is surprising for any City player. This doesn't, doesn't usually happen. There's usually rotation there and they have had the opportunity to rotate and he hasn't rotated. So I don't know how much of that is down to the price tag and the f- fact that they, there's maybe a sense that they have to play him so soon after paying that sort of fee. Um, but yeah, I think he's done well in general, just maybe, yeah, playing a little bit safer than he usually does. Um, but yes, yeah, obviously already a very important player for Man City and, and will improve, I'm sure. Yeah, and someone who's been a really, really important player for Manchester City over the last 12 months, I think it was this week actually was his one-year anniversary of joining the club, is Ruben Diaz, Jonathan, captain at the moment as well. If you could choose one of Van Dijk or Ruben Diaz, who would be in your team? I mean, it's very, very close. Uh, it slightly depends who he's going to be playing alongside. Um, but if let's I'm... say it's, Let's say it's Martin Lawrence. He's playing alongside Martin <laughs> Lawrence. Yeah. That, that's I had a decent season at centre back once. I had one. I've never, up. I've never seen Martin play. So that with an really old want. boys, with an old boys player of the season at, at centre back one season, maybe eight years ago. So if that so helps, this, this, this centre back needs guidance. Let's put it that way. He needs guidance. You have got to choose someone to guide. Well, I, I, I think, I think, I think they both can guide. I just think, I, I'd, look, if, if I'm starting a, a franchise from scratch, you know, if, if I'm sort of creating i don't know the the washington wilsons in mls oh i like that 
Um, there and, and and you're sort of giving me a massive budget. Go out buy yeah you know, your three marquee players from around the world, and we'll fill it up with with local lads. Uh, and uh, we've decided as a board that that one of them is going to be a centre back currently playing in the Premier League. I would probably just about go for Van Dyke because I think he's a little bit better on the ball. But at the moment, I'd say Diaz is probably the better defensively. Now, Van Dijk at his absolute best, I think they're pretty pretty close. But we've seen Van Dijk got a little bit bullied against Brentford in the same way he was against Villa last season, which is pre-injury. Um, which is, is a, you know, I think we hadn't really seen that before the Villa game, and partly has to do with Liverpool's press not being great that day and, and all the kind of uh, the COVID-related issues of of truncated uh, pre-seasons and things. Um, and I think he's not quite back to his best post-injury. So if we're taking, if we're assuming Van Dijk will at some point in the next two or three months get back to his defensive best, I would just about say Van Dijk, but it's it's extremely close. It's difficult because I, I would have gone Van Dijk as well from a, a leadership point of view, but it does feel a bit more now like Diaz is becoming one of the real leaders in the, in the City squad. I don't know whether you saw his interview after the game against Paris. You know, he came out and gave a really good interview after, after that game. I think I'd just about go Van Dijk, but I think the gap is edging edging closer every single day. Martin? I would, yeah, just give it to Van Dijk based on that sort of body of sort of knowledge of his sort of Premier League performances. Um, but yeah, I think you're almost looking at things that are, for me at least, not traditional sort of centre back traits. Maybe passing now is, but sort of certainly ability on the ball and also threat in the box. I would probably give to Van Dyke over over DS as well. So you're almost having to look elsewhere. Maybe his pace he's faster as well. But yeah, I agree that if it was a sort of one on one defensive situation, I might go for. Diaz, he's more of a sort of traditional, puts his body on the line defender and uh, Van Dijk's got more sort of physical attributes about him. But yeah, I think you're almost looking at non-defensive quality, so to speak, to, to separate the two. So I, I would just about give it to Van Dijk, but agree that on current form, maybe Diaz. And sticking with you, Martin, let's go through the bet builder for this game then. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a very short bet builder. There's only actually two legs uh, because yeah. just we got burned by Pep Roulette in the week uh, in a, in our Champions League bet builder. We had uh, Gabriel Jesus to score, didn't start. So never play Pep Roulette because the house always wins. Um, so yeah, we've, we've avoided any sort of Man City players um, and we're basing it on our predictions actually. So it might be worth going for our predictions, <laughs> which are all the same. No, they're all the same. Uh, I can tell you what they one. all are. If you like. They're all 2-1. We've all gone for 2-1 Liverpool. Um, so we are going for an, another correct score, 2-1 Liverpool, but we're throwing in to make the odds pretty massive, actually. We're throwing e- either team to score a penalty. Uh, that's played out in the last three meetings between the two. Uh, Liverpool scored two penalties. Salah's got both and De Bruyne got scored a penalty the time before that. So Liverpool to win 2-1 and either team to score a penalty was 29-1, to boosted to 36-1 to uh, by Bet Victor. So, yeah, decent boost there. Um, the, the links will be in the normal places in the description to the video and we'll put it out on YouTube and do gamble responsibly. These bets are good, but the problem I've got is that Bet Victor are taking fifty percent of my money back for for doing this podcast every week because the bets are just so <laughs> tantalising. They they, they, they they reel you in. Although I will say, if Man City get a penalty. I feel like they miss quite a lot of penalties. So they I can do. imagine us. I can imagine us missed, falling down yet again. I feel like they've missed two against Liverpool in in the past, and Mares definitely missed one, and maybe the Bruyne as well. But penalties scored in the last three meetings between the two. So yeah. So that does us then for this week's preview of the Premier League fixtures. Thanks ever so much for joining us. And thanks to Martin and Jonathan, as ever, for accompanying me on the podcast. If you're not already subscribed to the channel with your post notifications on, then if you could do that, that really helps the channel grow. Comment as well with your thoughts on what we've said. Do we make sense? Is it a load of rubbish? Let us know in the comments. Hopefully you have a great rest of the week and enjoy the weekend's football. Stay safe.